Workhouses, gruel, and baby farms. The social context of Oliver Twist. Be sure that before you continue with this video, that you watch my introduction to Charles Dickens' video. This will help you read Oliver Twist and other Dickens novels. The link is provided here, or you can just search on YouTube for Introduction to Dickens and Reading Tips. What does Dickens mean by parish in Oliver Twist? In England, civil parishes and their governing parish councils evolved in the 19th century. The word parish acquired a secular usage, a usage outside of church and religion, and no longer signified the location of literal churches, but rather acted as simple geographic markers. As Dickens' novel tell us, each parish had its own committees, boards, workhouse, baby farm, beetle, and so on. Dickens spends lots of his energy satirizing the inefficiency, exaggerated self-importance, and corruption of these institutions. In terms of the context around which Oliver Twist was composed in England, here are some facts to keep in mind. When Dickens wrote Oliver Twist, there was mass unemployment in England. There were no social services or welfare. There was no way to get credit. Amazingly, one out of every 12 women was a, was a prostitute. Children had 50% chance of living beyond the age of five. So the year the novel was published, half of the funerals in London were for little children. Orphanages would only accept children with married parents. They would not accept illegitimate children. So babies would be left all around the town in train stations and alleys, sort of like we see roadkill today. So as a result of all this anarchy, the baby farming industry developed. This was a business throughout England where if parents couldn't look after their child, they could send it to a baby farmer with the understanding that the parents could visit at any time. Now, legitimate baby farms were providing a valuable service, sort of like the welfare system does today with abandoned or orphaned children. But the corrupt baby farms underfed or even killed the children in order to earn money and to avoid expense. If you have a strong constitution and want to learn more about this, there is a compelling documentary about Victorian baby farmer Amelia, that's Amelia with an A, Amelia Dyer, D-Y-E-R, who would volunteer to foster parents' babies for the price of anything between 5 and 40 pounds. She would habitually exterminate the babies, usually by smothering them upon their birth or putting them in a parcel and sending them down a variety of local rivers. This is a true story. So, what did the real Charles Dickens think of all this? Well, there was a specific scandal in January of 1849 in which a cholera epidemic had spread throughout a baby farm in the town of Tooting. This baby farm is depicted in the illustration here. Dickens wrote an article in The Examiner with the satiric title, The Paradise at Tooting. He writes that the kids were devastated by cholera because the baby farm was, quote, brutally conducted, vilely kept, preposterously inspected, dishonestly defended, a disgrace to a Christian community, and a stain upon a civilized land. One of the early satiric moments from Oliver Twist is Dickens' commentary on the baby farm in which Oliver is born. Immediately after Oliver's birth, the narrator tells us. Now, if, during this brief period, Oliver had been surrounded by careful grandmothers, anxious aunts, experienced nurses, and doctors of profound wisdom, he would most inevitably and indubitably have been killed in no time. There being nobody by, however, but a pauper old woman who was rendered rather misty by an unwanted allowance of beer, and a parish surgeon who did such matters by contract, Oliver and nature fought out the point between them. The result was that after a few struggles, Oliver breathed, sneezed, and proceeded to advertise to the inmates of the workhouse the fact of a new burden having been imposed upon the parish by setting up as loud a cry as could reasonably have been expected from a male infant 
who had not been possessed of that very useful appendage, a voice, for a much longer space of time than three minutes and a quarter. <coughs> so what really is a workhouse in Oliver Twist? Well, to go back a little bit, in 1601, the Poor Law Act was passed, the first Poor Law Act, putting the administration of the poor rates into the hands of each individual parish in England. And this was, at best, sporadically effective. Now, after the new poor law in 1834, each parish, and now a more geographical marker than a religious one, was to have its own workhouse in which families were separated, work was tireless, meager meals were eaten in silence, and people often starved or were worked to death. The workhouse system was meant to judge and punish the poor. It never, tragically, dealt with the causes of poverty. The poor law had recommended four separate institutions for relief of poverty, and the categories were as follows. The aged, the children, the able-bodied males, and the able-bodied females. In Peter Ackroyd's biography, Dickens, he writes, The workhouse was tearing families apart by consigning sexes to different quarters within the same workhouse, and with the abolition of the search for the father clause, which meant it was no longer required that the fathers of illegitimate children should be traced, it constituted a total disregard of the need for family life among the poor and needy. And as Dickens himself writes in Chapter 2 of Oliver Twist, the New Poor Act offered a choice between, quote, being starved by a gradual process in the house or by a quick one out of it. Notice, by the way, in the picture here, we have a group of children at Crumps Hall Workhouse around 1896. Believe it or not, workhouses were not abolished in England until 1948. And the positive theological statements on the wall, God is good and God is just, provide a stark irony against their tragic backdrop. They're almost a foreshadowing of the sign outside of Auschwitz concentration camp. Arbeit macht frei, work will make you free, in the chasm between these noble words and the dark truth around them. So what was the work done in a workhouse? Well, there are records of practical workhouse labor, such as shoemaking, but people in workhouses generally worked their six, ten-hour days per week on mind-numbing tasks, such as breaking rocks or picking apart pieces of rope as you see in the two illustrations here. This is often why workhouse life and prison life were often, are often compared with each other. For Dickens, the rote mindlessness and pointlessness of the work must have recalled his days at Warren's blacking factory, an echo he longed not to hear. <coughs> okay, so seriously, how bad can gruel be? I mean, I mean, Oliver asks for more of it, right? Well, Workhouse gruel was a mixture of oatmeal, water, and salt. The picture on the right here shows thicker, more substantial gruel, sort of like the thick oatmeal or cream of wheat we might have for breakfast now. The picture on the left is closer what Oliver and his workhouse mates would have received, a watery porridge lacking enough sustenance for any growing boy. It's important to remember that the new poor law of 1834 created a specific menu for adult workhouse inmates, which included stale bread and an occasional piece of meat. Children, though, were to be fed, quote, at discretion, which meant it was entirely up to each workhouse. To save money, workhouses often underfed their children toward a gradual starvation or chose not to feed them at all. In the world of Oliver Twist, a beetle was a minor parish official whose duties included preserving order at civil functions and after 1834 beetles would often help manage parish workhouses like Bumble does in Dickens' novel. Beetles were meant to represent the poor to the various boards created by the new poor law but like many of the bureaucracies of the day beetles often became self-important and corrupt you can almost see it in the posture and face and gesture and pointing of Bumble here in this illustration. As you read the novel, you'll notice that Dickens' comic satire of Mr. Bumble also communicates his real thoughts and feelings, 
about what he perceived to be a needless and often harmful institution. <coughs> if the novel Oliver Twist was said to have a central motif, one could easily argue that it was the threat and the image of hanging. The name Twist was actually a Victorian slang term for a person being hanged, and the novel is peppered with such slang, slang such as the drop. While public hangings were still a popular spectacle for citizens, Dickens, in his book Pictures of Italy, calls capital punishment a, quote, ugly, filthy, careless, sickening spectacle. Okay, so here's a big question I think a lot of readers face. Does Dickens exaggerate? So a 21st century reader of Oliver Twist can't help but to ask this question. I mean, reading the novel, we ask, really? Isn't this a bit much? Well, Peter Ackroyd writes, There were the poor men and women whose lives and habitations Dickens would periodically visit. In those passages from Bleak House and Oliver Twist, when he describes such things and has often been unjustly accused of fantasy or melodrama, and this is the important part, Ackroyd tells us, Dickens was speaking less the barest truth. So when we're tempted to think that the poor really didn't have it this bad, Ackroyd asserts that Dickens is actually understating the reality. So good luck with Oliver Twist. As you'll read, as you read, you'll be able to tell that this is not Dickens' best novel. He's a young man writing his first serious novel here, but the novel features some iconic moments, some amazing writing. Obviously, a lot less singing than the musical, but and it's the first example of Dickens' idea of streaky bacon, that fact that comedy and tragedy, hardships and joy, live right next to each other in real life, and they often do in fiction as well. And in Oliver Twist, we see a young writer, full of energy and hope, beginning to grow up. Enjoy. <laughs>